I would like to invite the next speaker, speaker for today. It's a, uh, Dr. Adrian McDermott. He's director of the Immunology Core Laboratory of the Vaccine Research Center at NIH. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to Esper and the organizers uh, for inviting me once again. And um, also thank you to all, all, all of you for coming after lunch. And I'm, I'm trying to go, I'll try and keep you awake, honestly. I will. Um, anyway, so this is the third talk from the Vaccine Research Center. So um, I'm going to touch on some of the things that Rick talked about and some of the things that Barney talked about. And what I'm going to do really is kind of an overview of what we're doing with HIV clinical trials right now and how we're trying to elicit neutralizing antibodies. So first let me introduce you to, this is the mothership of, um, of the Vaccine Research Center in Building 40 on main campus in Bethesda, Maryland. And this incredibly good-looking bunch of people here are all the investigators and the program chiefs. And you've met a few of these, Barney Graham, Rick just talked, and I'm sure uh, some of you are familiar with this man at the front as well. So what the Vaccine Research Center does, it goes from basic research all the way into clinical trials, and it's rather like a biotechnology company. We do everything. We do everything from the basic research, even to the manufacturing. We have a manufacturing plant um, in Frederick, Maryland. So here we have the basic research. We go to process development, which is in a place called Gaithersburg. We then go to GMP manufacture from that, and that is in Frederick, which is another like 14 or 15 miles away. The product then gets vialed here and comes back to the vaccine, um, the vaccine research center but the clinic this time, it gets given to people. And then my program, which is here, actually does all the analysis. This is one of the robots that we have. And they do all the analysis of all the products that the Vaccine Research Center does. So the program itself does basic B cell research. And we do B cell research in influenza and HIV. And then 40 miles up the road now, we've got a new facility which we do analytical immunology at, and, and we follow good clinical laboratory practices up there. In other words, very legislated, controlled assays. This is just an example of some of the work we've been doing. So we do very basic research into um, influenza B cell responses. But then also, as Rick was just talking about, we do a lot of the PK analysis for lots of people in this room and, um, and for all the people at the Vaccine Research Center. And this also yields a lot of papers. This is courtesy of Lucio Gama. And this is just the number of trials that uh, the VRC is taking on. And this is just the number of broadly neutralizing antibody trials. As you can see, in 2013, there were very few. Right now, in 2019, the green line are the, just the VRC trials. The blue line are the network trials, such as ACTG, etc. This is the cumulative. But then there's this PI trial here, and some of the people in the room are responsible for this line increasing, Mike. <laughs> so these are just the active clinical trials in the Vaccine Research Center itself. And as you can see, we've increased the number of clinical trials that we've been doing year upon year upon year. And those that are in red are the ones that we're doing B-cell analyses on. So these complex piece of analyses that I will tell you about are going to be applied to these trials as well as some trials coming from the Gates Foundation as well. This is a picture of not the only chap who's doing the work, but a guy who's doing the work in the new laboratory that we've just built, which is the basic B-cell research laboratory that is now transferred to um, that's transferred to this new facility we now have in Gaithersburg. And this is an example of some of the flow cytometers that you heard about this morning from Bob. So um, we have a level of compliance. So if this is where B cell analytics used to be when we do influenza studies, this is actually where it has to be when we're doing clinical trial studies. It has to be a lot more controlled, and we have to have quality systems in place. 
what kind of trials are we actually looking at? Well, we're looking at different vaccine strategies, such as native envelope trimers, immunofocusing strategies, epitope-based vaccine strategies. And I'll go on and explain kind of to you all about what these strategies actually do. But just to put this into context, these are the major trials that have gone on in the last 20 or 30 years. The only one that's had a modest effect is the RV144. And any of you know about trials, HIV vaccine trials? This has been a much vaunted study with many, many um, correlates of immunity studies being brought off this. But it had a modest, a modest efficacy of 31.2%. So what's happened since then? <clears throat> so there's some evidence for vaccine-induced protection. So non neutralizing antibodies against V1, V2 were associated with protection. The protection waned really quickly to 6 to 12 months. There was no broadly neutralizing antibodies induced, especially against tier 2 viruses. So what's next? Well, they've got a large repeat of the same trial in a different population. They have also um, a mosaic trial in the context of a viral vector, which is ad 26. But how can we actually induce broadly neutralizing antibodies, just the ones that we've been hearing about from Rick, and the ones that we will hear about from Rebecca tomorrow afternoon? <clears throat> this is a slide I pinched from Ro here. And this is basically the failure to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies. And this, this was simply taking a GP120 from the native envelope spike and vaccinating people with it. And it had absolutely no effect. So why doesn't native GP120 not induce broadly neutralizing antibodies? Well, GP120 does not recapitulate the native spike. Broadly neutralizing antibodies do not emerge instantly, but in response to um, co-evolution or somatic hypermutation. GP120 does not activate desirable B cells that have an intrinsic capacity to produce those neutralizing antibodies. It's not targeting the correct lineages. And GP120 contains many potential distractive epitopes. John Moore, who will talk on Wednesday afternoon, will go into more detail about the step forward that we've made here. And it's the generation of a cleaved native HIV trimer called bg 505 and what John uh, has done is basically a stable, structural, and antigenic mimic of a native cleaved envelope trimer. And it should induce neutralizing antibodies. Both Roe here and Peter Kwong at the Vaccine Research Center have gone a step further with that. And if you think about the native trimer <clears throat> as being a flower, this is the prefusion state. And then when it sees CD4, it gradually opens up. So how can we just have the native trimer just in this confirmation so people can be immune to the virus that's incoming and not the one that's in CD4? Well, we chemically strap it up with different um, prolines. And we've introduced these three mutations here that basically do not allow the confirmation to go from this to this and therefore will not engage CD4. That's one strategy. So immune focusing. What we want to do is focus, if you want to focus the immune response just on this target, these guys can be very distracting. And I think that's what happened in the GP120 vaccine trial, the VAX003. So you can mask these epitopes by adding various structures, such as sugars, or you can just slice them off and make a... Um, just a small protein that will elicit exactly the epitope that you want to elicit. And this has been done somewhat with taking CD4 binding site, which you see here in magenta, and just taking that um, external outer domain, and you can do um, and what Bill Sheaf did, who did this work, did eight iterations, 34 mutations, and he sampled all these different positions. So there's a lot of chemistry involved here, and he came out with an engineered HIV outer domain which we actually called EOD, external outer domain. And then he's got a new immunogen, and it's called germline targeting, and then he's got a number eight. 
The people at the Vaccine Research Centre are actually taking that protein and gone a step further and taken some of the distracting epitopes, even from that small protein, and engineered this MUT or MUT16. Here we see, this is MUT16. Here, well, it's all very blurred, isn't it? Um, but basically, MUT16 actually outperforms the original parent. Yeah. That's in, in, uh, in the terms of breadth and in the terms of how avidly it binds. What's an example of epitope-based vaccine? This is where you can actually take your target epitope, isolate it, and put it on a scaffold protein. Recently, again, Peter Kwong has done this. Um, he identified an antibody in his laboratory that recognized the fusion peptide. And him and John Muscola have been working on this quite diligently. And what they've done, they've taken just that fusion peptide, they've coupled it to um, KLH, and then used a SOSIP trimer to boost with. And in animal models, they've got greater than 30% utilization against HIV isolates. So now there's a proposed vaccine trial in the second quarter of 2000, uh, 2020 where they will use the fusion peptide followed by BG505. The, the, that's, this DS is the, is the SOSIP that's tied up and then maybe come back with a altered fusion peptide sequence. <clears throat> What's an example of lineage-based vaccine strategy? Well, as we know, VRCO1 up here is 31% mutated. And that's a lot for an antibody. If you were in the flu world and you saw something that was 10 or 12% mutated, that's a lot of somatic hypermutation. 31% is clearly a consequence of being infected for so long with HIV and some disruption in the B cell compartment. So what has actually happened is that you have this maturing VRCO1 antibody that starts off somewhere probably round about um, the time when the individual contracted HIV and matures over a number of years, maybe even 15 years, to get this mature VRCO1 antibody. And that's a very tall order to try and, um, try and get an antibody from vaccination that is 31% mutated. We can do maybe 20, we can do 12 very easily. So this is a scheme of how can we educate B cells to make broadly neutralizing antibodies. Well, first we have to identify what the unmutated common ancestor, that's what UCA means in this context. And we know that there's a certain, there's a particular rearrangement. The rearrangement is a heavy chain called 1-2 that is combined with a light chain of five amino acids. So we know exactly what the uh, signature of those antibodies is. And we can identify these on naive B cells. So what we want to do, we want to have an immunogen, such as the one for the CD4 that I've just described, with all the glycans masking the, ones, the parts that we don't want. And we can try and design immunogens that will drive this immune response all the way to VRCO1. So it's all order because it's 31%. Now, what is this like, right? So if you imagine that you're a soccer player, you're like 10 years old, you're on a soccer team, you've got a friend who's really good, but the friend doesn't actually get educated in soccer, rather like a naive B cell would. Well, you probably end up sitting on the couch drinking beer, right? Whereas if you had one of the little guys at the front, they may turn into Lionel Messi. The same for non-utilizing and utilizing antibodies. Something happens in the pathway that drives this amount of talent. Okay, so what Bill Sheaf has done is, as I say, he's taken this CD4 binding site, he's made an engineered immunogen out of it, he's then multiplexed that immunogen on lumazine synthase. It takes some practice to say lumazine synthase. And then what he uses is this, this is the immunogen that has just gone into clinical trials. So what he's trying to do is, this is the signature, this VH1-202 in this case, and he's trying to pair that up in a germinal center to get antibody secreting cells and get mutated memory B cells. 
in the second, third, fourth round, what they want to do is to take a variant of the initial immunogen and drive that lineage back into a germinal center and get antibody secreting cells again, but this time get a mutated B cell which is further along on that pathway. This process may have to happen multiple times. And one of my questions in B cell immunobiology is can we actually find any difference between the prime and boost B cells? So these are the vaccine strategies that are currently ongoing in the field right now. So for the SOSIP trimer, there's two trials ongoing today. For immunofocusing, there's one trial going today and more planned for 2020. Epitope-based vaccine design, one trial planned for 2020. Lineage-based, there's one trial ongoing. So this is where we have to be very careful about how we analyze these B-cell-based vaccine trials. So these are all the trials. As you see, this is Bill Sheaf's trial, which is the EODGTA. That's just that little CD4 binding site protein. John's got a trial with the HVTN that started. The VRC, we have our own trial with the DS. That's the one that's all tied up. Robin Shattuck over in London and, and with the European AIDS Vaccine Initiative, they have a trial. <clears throat> There's a trial going on again with John's immunogen um, with the CAVD up in, um, up in Seattle in the United States. John has a trial that we're working on with him, which is a germline targeting um, trimer, which he may talk about tomorrow. There's more trials down here. Another one that's driven, um, that's trying to generate some neutralizing antibodies. So in general, what we have to do when we start thinking about how do we analyze these clinical trials? Well, we have to have the provision for reliable qc HIV protein probes that are all exactly the same for the whole trial. So we want final quality assessment using um, antigenicity assays. We have to quality control these. We have to have epitope knockouts, and I'll, I'll describe that in a minute. Standardization and qualification of flow sorting. This is the very unglamorous world of vaccine analyses this standardization and qualification. And all it takes is documentation and more documentation. Generally, B cell lineage analyses are put into the exploratory category of a clinical trial. We can't really have it as a primary because there are so many things that could potentially go wrong. And so what we generally do is say, okay, we'll have an ELISA as a primary because it's easy to do. One of the things that I think a lot of investigators in this room can sympathize with. We have to develop an analytical plan really early on. So when you get your fresh samples, I'll, I'll explain to you a little bit about fine needle aspirates. And also the influence on trial and testing proximities. If you need fresh samples, you need to have your clinical trial going right by your lab so that you can get those clinical samples really quickly. And also you need dedicated staff and equipment, which we now have and access to good bioinformatics. And I think that's a huge thing that we often underestimate. So if we look at all these clinical trials that are ongoing, the Vaccine Research Center is certainly involved in three of them. But what can we do? Now, Bob presented some work on looking at flow plots today. And what I've got on this flow plot is probe, probe two and the probe two variant. In other words, what we're trying to do is trying to knock out what we want in order that we can find what we need. Okay, I'll explain that a little bit more. But if you can isolate, single isolate these cells, you can determine the exact phenotype of the memory B cell, thereby informing your development for the next iteration of your vaccine imaging. You can even immortalize those B cells, and Rick's lab has actually done some great work in using this system to actually immortalize memory B cells and naive B cells. You can do bulk sorting and just look at um, heavy and light chains. And we do a lot of this for um, when, we're, when we're looking at bone marrow in influenza, actually. Or we can do, this is the workhorse of what we do, single B cell sorting and allows us to discern paired heavy and light chains from the same cell. So what we do, we sort, index sort into single wells. We then generate 
cDNA, and we do a couple of rounds of PCR. So we do six PCRs, because we do a couple of rounds for three different chains. And then we sequence. <clears throat> so if we use a trimer, or if we use a targeted protein, such as EODGT8 or so MUTE16, what we're doing, we're pulling single cells out of a population of cells. And this is our knockout protein. So we don't want the knockout, but what we do want is the protein that is reflecting exactly the area of the protein that we want. And it's that population there. And, in, and this would be here, the MUTE16 identified CD4 binding site cells coming here. For those of you virologists, we could look at it this way. Here we have a lady kissing a frog. So what we're trying to find is a prince here, right? So she kisses that frog, doesn't turn into a prince. She kisses that frog, that doesn't turn into a prince. And these are the ones that don't turn into princes, and these are the ones that do. So we could... So, for example, to detect naive B cell memory precursors, you may have to screen maybe 100 million cells or more. And for the EOD GT8, if we screen 100 million cells, we may get one in five million. Detection of memory B cells is dependent upon the efficiency of the imaging, to tell you the truth. So uh, we're still trying to determine that now. Then, as Bob was saying again this morning, Rapidly evolving field in technology is making screening more specific. And we can couple the BDS6 sorter, which is five lasers and 50 parameters, with this 10x fluid, fluid platform, and it becomes very, very powerful. So what about the EOD GT8 trial? We're actually doing the analysis for this trial right now. I can't tell you any of the results because it's a clinical trial. But this is the trial itself. We have 18, well, 24 participants. We have 18 in one group, which is a low-dose group. And we had six placebos. And we have 18 in the next group and six placebos. So we have 48. It's been funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The sponsor is IAVI. The clinical sites are the George Washington University. That's in downtown DC. And these are the two guys who are doing the investigation. And also at the University of... Washington, Seattle. The reason why we split it is because there's so much work to do and it's so intense in these clinical trials. And it's only 48 people. These are the two trial sites. What we've done, this is the schematic of samples that we're collecting. So the individuals are given this EOD GT8 on lumazine synthase at week one. We then collect an FNA. We then collect PBMC samples before and after. We have another FNA after boost. But we also have a plasma sample after boost. So currently, we have 12 volunteers in the low dose, all enrolled. Eight of those 12 have completed their um, post-second vaccination leukophoresis. 10 out of those 12 have completed their first FNA here. Eight of the 12 have got the second FNA. So we're really moving along with this trial, which is a unique trial, remember, because one, it's got a unique readout. And two, it's a unique approach to try and generate CD4 binding site antibody. Let me just talk about, this is the fresh PBMCs. So these fresh PBMCs have gotten to us really quickly. Um, so maybe within hours of them being taken. And this is the gating schema until we get to EOD GT8 positive plasma cells. Those of you who do memory B cell and plasma cell stuff, you're going, but... Plasma cells downregulate their BCR. So how can, you how can you pick up plasma cells with a probe? Well, this is very soon after vaccination. This is seven days after vaccination. And I presume some of these cells are still downregulating the BCR on the surface of the, of, of the cell. We actually do this for flu very successfully. And we do it for Ebola very successfully. Doesn't happen in all clinical trials. FNA. Honestly, this seems the most painful procedure, but I think it's very good. Um, fine needle aspirates. And what they do, they do an ultrasound here, yeah, and they locate your um, palpable lymph node, and they stick a needle straight into the lymph node so we can get an idea about where your immune system is in recognizing that immunogen at that time. So sampling, three weeks post-vaccination, when new germinal centers have developed. This was de uh, This timing was developed by Shane Crotty and the monkey. 
allows us for sampling of early cell populations with less mutagenesis. In other words, it gives us a bit of a pre-read on where the immune system's going with this particular immunogen. Allows for sampling of cells responding to recent vaccination and not previous exposures. Because the dogma is that you can re-enter a, if you're a memory B cell, you can re-enter the lymph node at any time. Gabrielle Vittora is finding that more naive B cells enter the lymph node than actually memory B cells. So this may go some way of proving that particular theory. What doing fine needle aspirates actually give us is the ability to identify naive and germinal center populations that are present. So those cells that are coming into the germinal center and those cells that are in the germinal center and undergoing somatic hypermutation. And by a series of, um, of different, of combinations of different markers, <clears throat> we can actually pull out pro-positive, um, pro-positive germinal center cells that are undergoing somatic hypermutation, and we can pull out pro-positive naive B cells that are in there and ready to move into a germinal center and undergo somatic hypermutation. And this has been very powerful. And we're currently analyzing these techniques, uh, sorry, these results right now. So these are complex clinical trial analyses. And essentially, it's all about the process. So if a sample is taken, so for example, a FNA sample or a PBMC sample or even a plasma blast sample, we give it to a man who sits on a bike and he rides it through DC and he arrives. And as soon as it arrives, we do this flow cytometry panel and we index sort into these plates like I showed you before. We then generate cDNA. And because it's a clinical trial, we have SOPs galore. Again, we then take that cDNA and we do our six PCRs for heavy and light chains. And we then we give it to another man who then takes it to a company that's going to sequence it for us. And that's this company, GeneWiz. And then we send it to a statistical center because we need good bioinformatics. And this is the, the statistical center that is based at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And again, we have lots of SOPs for that. So what are the readouts? Readouts for this clinical trial, circulating serum antibody. We can have a look at binding. We can look at the... Um, we can look at how uh, the affinity of those uh, antibodies that have been produced. And we also look at the neutralization. And then, of course, we're looking for the, uh, the frequency of VH1-2 with a 5 amino acid light chain. So overall, in this trial, neutralization is not expected from prime, right? Because we want a 31% mutated. We don't want a 5 or 10% mutated. Binding assays will represent the primary immunogenicity readouts. But we may get some off-target. Remember that we took EOD GT8 and we put some more sugars on there to stop the off-target stuff? Well, those, that protein may still generate off-target antibodies. And really, the critical endpoint of this is this sequencing of VH1-2 with a 5-amino acid light chain. Now, this is a CD4 binding site protein. All these antibodies all bind CD4. And there are some more. We just went to Keystone and we heard about three or four more. So these ones use the heavy chain of 1-202. So there's quite a number in that family. And we call this the VRC01 class. There's some other with different heavy chains, which we can identify from the same experiment. And then down here, we've got some VH146 derived antibodies, of which this list is growing. We heard about two or three more of these. So what's the specific germline usage of your antibodies? And we can see this using all the techniques that I've just described to you. However, again, we have to be very careful about how we perform these techniques. So again, Rick's lab made us an immortalized, naive B cell with a VH, uh, with the VRC01 class. We tested 50 healthy volunteers, and we included different ethnicities because we thought that might be interesting because it's not going to be a trial that just goes on in the United States. It may be one that goes on in South Africa, Uganda, or Rwanda. And we had the samples anyway, so we thought we'd test them. Alberto Q 
Kijiji in the group, who is now at the Karolinska, <coughs> he actually did a precision experiment. This is for the very geeky people in the audience. Um, who he measured the frequency after seeding with one, three, nine, 27, and 81 cells, and then tried to see what he got back in three different experiments. And what he got back was 0.99995. So he did very well. He actually got back what he put in. So this assay is sensitive down to one in five million naive B cells and highly reproducible. So what we did, we then ran this on the individuals from, these are the white Caucasians, these are um, African Americans, these are um, Asian Americans, and these, and these guys with a higher naive B cell frequency against CD4 binding site are from Rwanda, Uganda, and South Africa. So on average, we get about one in a million B cells that could give rise to broadly utilizing antibodies. We have higher frequency of B cells, individuals living in South and East Africa. And we've analyzed sequences for the presence of other CD4 antibodies. This publication is in preparation right now, and we've actually sent it off for review, so that's why there's no new data on it. So, if you have a look in the non-Africans and in the Africans, there's actually a slightly different distribution of the heavy chains and light chains that we pulled up in those individuals. And this is very interesting, because why would one population have a different naive B-cell population, uh, naive different B-cell frequency to the same antigen? And we don't really know that, and we're doing a lot of work in that. If you have a look at the memory B cells, there's some mimicry going on, but more or less, we don't have memory B cells against VRCO1. Like. But if we go back and we think about what, what are the naive B cells that we pulled out? So therefore, we're using this EODGTH, or this CD4 binding site protein, and we pulled out all the ones that I've highlighted here. Now, if we pull out this particular one, this N6, this is far more potent than VRCO1. So serendipitously, this trial may work even better than it was planned to work. This is a lot of conclusions for this, but essentially, we're going to have a look at more from a, uh, a research perspective. We're going to have a look at uh, more individuals. And we've started collecting... Um, Cells from Thailand, we've got some more from Africa, and we're talking about the ones from Brazil, but if anyone's got any suggestions in the audience of populations where we can get 100 million cells, then we'll certainly have a look at a Japanese population, maybe, Tetsuro. That would be good. So, um, so we developed this robust, robust, specific, reproducible, and precise workflow, and we're applying this to clinical trials right now. Um, the EOD... GTA analysis as just from the naive B cells, we found different signatures. I'm going to tell you a little bit about B cells just for the end of this. And I'm going to concentrate on influenza, which is the other work that we do in the lab. So these two influenzas are both group two influenzas. There's an H3, which we've all seen and H7, which very few of us have seen. And the, and the ones marked in red <coughs> are the epitopes that we've not seen before that are distinct between H3 and H7. And we can discern these when we do a vaccine trial because we can use an H7 probe and we can use an H3 probe. And we see individuals who have not been exposed to H7 don't have any H7. And individuals following vaccination do. Okay, so now these are all new B cells, and all these B cells here and here are all pre existing B cells. So, in influenza, you, all, you have a lot more potential to mount a response against the head than you do against the stem because each new encounter with a new head leads to new memory B cells. Whereas the stem is fairly consistent. Like, between different H1s, or between an H1 and H5, or between an H3 and an H7, they're up to 90% similar. So mostly the B cells that recognize this part are pre-existing, because you've seen it before. So this is a good model to look at 
new and old B cells. So here we have your primary exposure and your secondary exposure. And so what we're working on now is, I wonder if we can do this for, say, variant 1 of EODGT8 and variant 2 of EODGT8. Look at prime and boost, depending on what the time frame is between your first exposure and your second exposure. B cells traditionally are um, subsetted into resting, activated, and then there's this region here, which is called the atypical, the exhausted, or the tissue-like memory population. And this is CD21 negative, CD27 negative. In HIV pathogenesis, this population increases over infection until such a time when you go on to antiretrovirals, that population then decreases and it all moves back into these two populations. But this has been noted also um, in malaria, in HCV, and HIV. If we just look at, again, going back to our flu vaccination, most of our cells are residing in this resting memory population and very few here. You then go to day 14 and you see there's an explosion of the activated memory population, which obviously are the activated cells. Those T cell immunologists in the audience would know this. And then it settles back down again, almost to resting state after day 90. However, if you take these two different populations of memory B cells, the resting and the activated, and you, do, um, and you have a look at single cell RNA-seq, there's about 155 genes that differentiate resting and activated memory. If we, if we take those genes and look to see which ones we can notice on the surface of the cell, then we can start to pull apart all these populations iteratively. So say, for example, we use that marker, and then we resort again, and then we do transcriptomics on that population, and then what's different about those two populations? What's different about those six populations? What's different about all those other populations? And this is a panel that we came out with. CD85J co-localizes with TBET, which you may have heard of. FCRL5 is an inhibitory receptor. CD19 is a standard B cell receptor. CD72 has actually been associated by um, Rafi Ahmed uh, to have a look at um, uh, B cells that re enter in a germinal center. CD62L, CD44, and CXCR5 are standard B cell markers. This publication has actually uh, just been submitted. Um, what we did, we then did Tisney plots, which again Mike showed you this morning. Sorry, Bob showed you this morning. Um, and what we see, if, you, if we take this H7, H, um, H7, H3 population, which is a pre-existing memory B cell population, what you see is that it starts off here, and then it spreads to here like it did before. This time we're using Tisney. We're not using, those, we're not using CD21 and CD27. And what you see, it returns to that stage again about a year later. Now, if we take the H7 population, remember, we've not seen the H7 population before. Very different picture. Starts out way over here, spreads all over this Tisney plot, and then resides in this quadrant here. So these are very different B cells, very different. So we've done some more work on these, and we're finding that there's many populations actually in there. That actually separates out. If we have a look, if we go back and then we take our activated populations one, two, and three that we've now defined them as, and we put them back onto that CD21, CD27 plot. We have a look at that. Even members of the same lineage, even the B cells of those lineages, have different states. So activation state one, two, and three. This is the Tisney. Then we've plotted it on the CD21, CD27. There's a lot of work to do on this, because what we're trying to do is identify a B cell that we want to target for vaccinations such as EODGT8, BG505, SOSIP, GT1.1, et cetera, all these new HIV immunogens. And if we can just monitor some of these populations preferentially, then maybe they're the ones that respond, they're the B cell populations that are responsible for going back into that germinal center and generating more somatic hyphen mutation and therefore leading to an HIV vaccine at the end of the day. If we have a look again over the course of vaccination, so if you keep your eye on this AM2 population, these are all the new 
cells, and these are the pre-existing cells. AM2 seems to be the static population that we have. The AM3 population seems to be quite high when we're generating new responses. And AM1 seems to be fairly consistent through the new responses, but very low in the pre-existing responses. So we're doing a lot more work, a lot more transcriptomics in these. And that's just saying what I just said. So the delineation of activated B cell populations in vaccine studies is, an, as again Bob was saying this morning, integrated technologies will provide additional immunomonitoring capabilities. So we'll get better at, monitor, at monitoring vaccines and designing vaccines. And we can use better B cell panels. We can iteratively do this again and again and again, the more vaccines that we look at. So our takeaway is more complex immunogens and vaccine strategies are being employed to elicit HIV broadly neutralizing antibodies. The requirement for increasingly controlled and sophisticated clinical trial analyses will inform future development and success of HIV vaccine strategies. The integration of technology will streamline the analysis of these vaccine trials. There's a whole bunch of people, it's like a whole town of people that we have to thank. But Bill Sheaf, um, who uh, has designed the EOD GT8 trial that we're currently doing, IRV who are running the trial, CABD who are funding the trial, my team at the Vaccine Immunology Program who work very hard at this, and those individuals who are generating the, all, all, all the participants and those individuals who are uh, actually recruiting them. And thank you very much and thanks for your attention. Any questions? Let's talk. Um, you discussed about the delivery of the, the vaccine into the lymph node. Have you selected lymph nodes or are you doing like random, choosing random lymph nodes? You can only do FNAs on palpable lymph nodes. I think that's the kind of, um, that's the kind of medical um, excuse for doing it, really. Um, and so that's normally the draining lymph node. So if you vaccinate in the arm, then draining lymph node will be. And um, lymph nodes in the hip or in the. No, no, it's a draining lymph node to where it's proximal to the site where you've been where you put your vaccine. Okay. Hey, Adrian. I I think what you guys are doing is, is absolutely terrific and it's the, the central laboratory aspect of this and the independent analysis and the ability to generate these highly sophisticated new techniques is just what the field needs and so I'm a great fan of you know, for all of these uh, sophisticated analytics you're putting together. I mean, five, five years or so ago I'd have said that we were limited in, in vaccine design by not knowing what to make. Nowadays, I think it's less so that we, we more understand how to make appropriate immunogens. I mean, we haven't got, surely, the perfect immunogens yet. But I think we have a much better understanding of how to make them. What we still lack is a, an understanding of how to persuade the immune system to respond to these immunogens in the way that we would wish. There's, there's, there's so much subtleties to the intersection between the antigen and the immune response that we're only grasping at. And the field has, has, has got to switch to a more immunology-focused um, sub-subject, and, and, it, and it will rest upon the kind of methodologies that you're developing. Yeah, we think so. So, so Adrian, if, if you wanted to carve um, an antibody, make an antibody sequentially with the best kind of neutralization and, and somatic hypermutation, what sorts of things could you do to, to promote uh, somatic hypermutation in, in an immunized person? That's a great question. I don't really have an answer for it, but um, I'd say probably you'd use a CD4 TFH um, adjuvant if you could, to try, because that seems to be the key, right? The TFHs seem to be the key in generating long-lasting immune responses. 
we could do with knowing what, what, what the trigger is between a memory B cell being released or a plasma cell being released that is short term or long term. And I think there's a lot of work going on in that. And we're actually doing a lot of work in that with transcriptomics looking at plasma cells to try and find out how we can preferentially induce plasma cells that go to the bone marrow, for example, and produce constitutive, like an HPV vaccine. We produce, after one vaccination, we produce really protective antibodies after one vaccination. We need to get to that stage with HIV at some point. So there's no magic source just at this moment in time. I think it, it's antigen design, it's adjuvant into the CD4s, and it's presenting the, uh, and presenting the immunogens in the correct way, probably via lumazine synthase or something. <laughs> and, and if I could ask you one other question, what's in it for a B cell to generate a more broadly neutralizing antibody? Is it just that the next generation is more, more uh, avid? I mean, binds with greater, that it binds the, the antigen with greater affinity? Or is that not a, a, a progressive linear relationship? Remember, why would it care about neutralization? Well, a B cell doesn't know if it neutralizes or not. Right, exactly. So why does it care? Well, because it's always trying to improve. For example, if you look at, um, we've got really good controls of this, because if you look at a VH169 <laughs> antibody that binds to the stem, of HA. It mutates to 8 or 10% and stops. And you can have, you can generate that when you're the age of 5, and by the time you're 80, that's not, there's no more somatic hypermutation happened in that lineage. Various, there's various reasons behind that, uh, there's lots of theories. Some say that because those antibodies actually bind, they bind to the FDC, thereby not allowing any more presentation, so they bind with a certain Ability to the FDC, but um, I let's not make neutralizing B cells that produce neutralizing antibodies some sort of like magic thing. They're just normal B cells, and it's just the turnover of B cells and this recognition of higher affinity and higher affinity and higher affinity. So it's just that thing that Gabriel Vittor is saying. It could be just new, naive B cells coming back into the lymph node. Questions. The, the first one, so I, because you mentioned TFH, mm -hmm. are you testing your immunogens for the capacity to trigger TFH? Because if they don't trigger TFH, then you don't get to, what, to where you want. If you believe in cognate help, yeah. so, so is that being done? So one of the one of the nice things about the FNAs is that you can actually do TFH at the same time mm -hmm. if you get enough cells. One of the drawbacks of the FNA is that sometimes you're not even getting a million cells. So you have to decide if you're going to do B cell or FNA. And in the context of this current clinical trial, the B cells are paramount. So we don't do... But when we have additional cells, then Shane Crotty is... etc. That whole group with Bill and Shane are going to start looking at the, the, the CD4 TFH and start characterizing those effects. Uh, okay, so my second question, so you showed a lot of um, Disney analysis. Are you at liberty to, uh, to describe what kind of genes make, make those differences, or? You know, I would like to get away from Disney analysis and into something else. Is, is mm -hmm. that workflow we were talking about lunch time? Mm -hmm. It'd be very nice if we could do that, but that's all we currently have. So there are some genes that repeatedly pop up, the list of which is not at my fingertips, but... Um, yeah, if you want to provide any help, we could, we could certainly go okay. through that data. So do you see any genes involved in, like, cytosine deaminases that promote hypermutations or...? Uh... No, no, we don't. That's one of the things I was looking for and we don't see any. Any other question? Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You.